during this Holy Week. And so for some of you, it's very new. You're like, I'm not doing something every day. Well, listen, most of them are online. So just gather around an iPad or on your smart TV at home um, and make sure that this whole week you're really focusing on Jesus and journeying with him all the way from Palm Sunday to the cross, to the tomb, and to the resurrection. Amen. So go on our app or on our website, and you'll see all those details there. Also, right after this service, if you are interested in learning more about our estate planning services that our denomination offers, it'll be in the pastor's office at 1030, so stick around and then find one of our staff members or just walk over to our office, and we'll be ready to welcome you there for that free seminar on finances. Well, um, today is Palm Sunday, and I must admit that um, I've never preached on Palm Sunday I talked to my friend. It was like, Pastor Larry always preaches on Palm Sunday. So I've never written a sermon on this passage, Pastor Deb. I, I was just, I was so overwhelmed by, by when I was reading because there's so many layers to what's happening on this Palm Sunday. For example, have you ever walked into a situation and you're all happy and like, hey, what's up, man, man? And then later on you realize there was a whole bunch of tension and drama that you stepped into and you had no idea. And later on someone told you like, dude, you totally missed and ruined a moment that we were having. That's kind of like what's happening. It happens to me all the time, I'm telling you, okay? Um, And who said yeah? (laughs) Pastor Kimmy. I'm like, what's up, people? And they're like crying and tears and demons are getting exercised. And I'm like, oh, my bad. I don't know what I stepped into. So Palm Sunday is a similar, similar situation, but at a greater, greater, greater degree. There's so much happening on the surface. And when you look underneath, you realize, oh, my Lord, there's so much that is to be uncovered here. There's so much richness, so much meaning, so much that I need to really reflect on. That's what Palm Sunday is all about. So for the introduction of this sermon, I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to use your holy imagination, your divine given imagination. I'm going to ask you to travel with me to that very day, that very first Palm Sunday, 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, this beautiful and ancient city. It was a city that was surrounded by a large wall. And to get into the city, you had eight main entry points, they're called gates. There's, I don't know all of them, but there's the Dung Gate, there's a Beautiful Gate, there's a Western Gate, there's the Main Gate. There's so many gates. And so to enter the city, you'd have to come in through one of these gates. I, I've been there, and it is truly an incredible marvel of architecture and of archaeology because that city and that mountain of Jerusalem has been inhabited for thousands of years by people. So travel with me to 2,000 years ago, the first Palm Sunday. And this is what happened on that first Palm Sunday. The gates open and the procession begins. Thousands are lining the streets, throwing flowers and laurels, waving madly, reaching to touch power as it passes by them. Security guards watch the crowd for dissidents and agitators and zealots intent on doing harm. The man coming through the gate sits tall in his saddle, looking every bit the champion that he is made to be. A mantle of authority rests easily on his shoulders as he climbs higher and higher to the center of the city, taking his rightful place as Lord and protector of the people. Now, this sounds like a political rally of our modern days, But the the parade that I'm describing took place 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. But no, this was not Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. This was another parade that was happening perhaps even on the very same day at the very same moment. I'm talking about the entry of Pontius Pilate into Jerusalem. You see, Pontius Pilate was a governor appointed by the Romans to govern Jerusalem. If you know a bit of your history, Israel was under Roman colonialism. And so they would put these hard leaders in place to make sure that no one acted out of place. And on Palm Sunday, the week of the Passover... This high and holy day for the Jewish people, Jesus and his disciples are making their yearly trip to Jerusalem, along with hundreds of thousands of other faithful Jews around the world who are coming to offer their Passover lamb as sacrifice in the temple. Pontius Pilate also came to Jerusalem 
during the time of Passover, but not to atone for his sins. Pilate didn't live in Jerusalem. He thought it was not his type of place. It was not very friendly to the Romans, as you can imagine. No, Pilate and all the other Roman governors, they lived in the bougie town of Caesarea by the sea. Think of Malibu, for example. But as appointed governor of Judea, his job was to keep the peace, especially during the holy days when emotions ran high among the citizens of Jerusalem who burned with revolutionary passion to overthrow the Roman oppressors. I know some of you would have been those crazy, crazy revolutionaries. You see, Pilate's position and his very life depended on maintaining order in the empire, especially during Passover, the festival celebrating Israel's freedom from the bondage of Egyptian slavery. So Pilate made the 60-mile journey to Jerusalem, accompanied by hundreds of Roman troops, to remind the Jews that they may be God's people, but Rome was still their master. You see, in the ancient custom, Pilate made a grand entrance into Jerusalem on the first day of Passover week, Palm Sunday, proceeding through the western gate accompanied by a sea of chariots and horses and infantry all adorned for combat with swords and spears. Can you see it? This powerful spectacle spectacle served as a declaration of Rome's unwavering authority designed to evoke a mixture of reverence and fear, demanding obedience and respect as he passed through the city's main gates. Meanwhile, at the east gate, the back gate, another parade was underway. This parade was just as carefully staged as Pilate's entry into Jerusalem. It was in every way the opposite, however, of Pilate's parade. A different vision for what the kingdom should be. A subversive action against the powers that ruled Jerusalem. You see, Jesus' humble yet triumphal entry into Jerusalem stood in contrast to the power and magnificence and brutality on display at the western gate by Pilate. Pilate rides in a white horse ready for war. Jesus rides in a humble donkey. You ever seen anyone go to war with a donkey? He brings peace while Pilate brings a sword. But this is how it was planned From the beginning of time. Jesus didn't stumble upon a donkey. Jesus didn't stumble upon a city with multitudes gathered. This was a carefully crafted prophetic moment that had been written about 500 years before it even happened. In the year 520 BCE, Zechariah the prophet wrote this prophecy. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem, see, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. You see, the crowds were well aware of this prophecy, and they also believed that one day the Messiah would come through the same gate that Jesus was walking into. Just read Ezekiel. So they went out to the fields and they cut palm branches. I see only one person brought their own palm branch today. Thank you, brother. They brought their own palm branches and they lined the entry point of the eastern gate. And then they saw Jesus riding on a donkey, coming down the Mount of Olives and making his way to the eastern gate. And this is what John 12, 12 says. The next day, The great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion, 
See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. This is the word of the Lord for us today. Would you pray with me as we dig into these scriptures today? Father, with so many layers in this scripture, we could easily leave confused and unchanged today. But I pray, especially for those who have been a part of the Christian church for decades and said, I've heard 30 sermons on Palm Sunday that today your word would still be living and breathing and touch their hearts and pierce their very souls. And for those of us who are a little unfamiliar with Palm Sunday and Holy Week and Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday, Lord, I pray for a new revelation and a a revelation that would lead to conviction and conviction that would lead to transformation. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Like I told you, I wrestled so much with this text. All all day Friday and Saturday, my family was like, what's wrong with you? In in, in Spanish, we have the word aguitado. Soy aguitado. Like I'm just drained by thinking about this because I don't know how this lands and and what I when my wife asked me is like what would you need to be better prepared for Sunday I said I just need some time to personally reflect before I write to give anything I just need this to sit with me in my heart today's sermon is going to touch our very hearts it's going to ask us to look inwardly it's going to ask us to open our hearts and to consider That maybe just like the crowds, our hearts are misguided and divided. If you were honest today, you would say, yes, my heart is often misguided and divided. You see, our misguided hearts often follow after wrong people. Just look at Netflix. How many shows on cults are there? Have you seen the shows? You'd think to yourself, why would anyone in their right mind ever follow such a charlatan? But we have misguided and divided hearts. And so we follow leaders and we follow celebrities. We follow the wrong people. But we also follow after experiences, having affairs, drunkenness, partying to excess. We also go after possessions. Our hearts love possessions. We love to chase after wealth and have cars that we can't afford. We think those things will save us and they will lead us to self-destruction in reality. You see, our divided hearts are constantly fighting within ourselves between choosing good and choosing evil, choosing love and choosing hatred, choosing to be merciful or taking vengeance on our neighbors. God's word or our own wisdom. God or our flesh. We are so broken. And that's what Palm Sunday brings to the surface. Yes. The fact that the crowds that worshiped and said, Hosanna, five days later cried out, Crucify him. So let's go back to the scene because it's rich with meaning. The first thing they do, according to the Gospel of Matthew, is that they throw their cloaks on the ground, according to Gospel of Matthew. It says that the men threw their cloaks on the ground so that Jesus, when he walked over it with the donkey, walked over the cloaks. Now, what is the meaning, and what are these cloaks? It's not just your, your Patagonia jacket, okay? It, it, it's, these weren't any cloaks. These were the prayer shawls, which on the collar had these words written, Lord of lords and King of kings, to remind the people to pray for the coming Messiah. And by throwing down their cloaks for Jesus, they were declaring that Jesus was God's promised Savior, God's promised Messiah, the anointed one. And they were right. Jesus was God's promised Messiah. Number two, they waved palm branches. Come on, brother, wave your palm branch. They waved palm branches like our children did. And it says they put them on the road. Growing up in the cults, if you don't know my story, you know that that's like every other sermon I have to mention that, okay? It changed my life, all right? Well, every time the leader, the apostle, would pass by in public, the crowds would go buck wild. Think of Michael Jackson. You've seen videos of people when they see Michael Jackson, what are they? They enter like into a trance. And so the people would go into a trance, and all of a sudden, a bunch of guys with bags and palm fronds would pop up out of nowhere. And they would start to give the, the palm branches away to all the people in the crowds. And I always wanted one, but they never gave them to the kids. 
that's so sad, but I'm actually glad now. And people would shout to the apostle, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Such blasphemy. But doesn't that show just how fickle our hearts are? How rather than doing that for Jesus and worshiping him alone, we do that to people, mere human beings. So they waved palm branches and they put them on the road. The palm branch was regularly used in Jewish culture. In the coins, you would see the palm branch, like the maple leaf on the Canadian coins or an eagle on American coins. It was a symbol of nationalism, of patriotism, of pride. But... Palms were also used by the zealots during the Maccabean Revolution. And so Rome at some point began to outlaw the use of palms because it symbolized we want revolution. So brother, put that away. We want revolution. (laughs) And if you brought this symbol out, you might just get arrested for that. So palm branches became to represent the patriotism that fueled the fight against the Romans, and this patriotism was on full display on this Palm Sunday. The crowds were not interesting. They were not interested in welcoming a peaceful leader. They wanted someone who would rally them to revolution and bloodshed so that they could finally be free from the yoke of Rome. Do I blame them? No. I would have had the biggest palm branch. Right? Like, let's go, revolution, down with Rome. Thirdly, they shouted, Hosanna. Say it with me, Hosanna, which is a desperate cry for help, meaning, please save us. Please save us. But they also quoted Psalms 118, a a psalm crying out to God for military victory from their enemies, but, uh, but also a psalm hidden with meaning of Jesus for all you nerds and those people that are going to go home and do extra credit tonight, read Psalms 118 and you're going to see Jesus in every stanza. Unknowingly, they they were quoting a psalm about Jesus. And the psalm says this, Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. So it was a military cry. Hosanna. God, save us from Rome. God, just like you did thousands of years ago in Egypt, do it again. Take down the Roman emperor. Take down our enemies. Swallow them up in the Red Sea again, oh Lord. Save us from them. And so one may wonder, did these people do anything wrong? Weren't they just, weren't they right for hailing Jesus as the promised Messiah? Weren't they right that he was indeed bringing a revolution? Weren't they right that they needed salvation from their enemies and that Jesus was coming to save them? Yes, they were right in the flesh, but not in the spirit. The gospel goes on to describe how it was most likely this same crowd that shouted Hosanna on Sunday, shouted crucify on Friday. When Jesus did not meet their expectations. Soon after his grand entrance, the Gospels record that Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. He cries over Jerusalem. And he judges them for not understanding the kind of peace that he was offering them. If Jesus was proud of the crowds, he would have said, I'm so proud of you. You are amazing. Instead, he curses the fig tree and he weeps over the whole city. You see, the Israelites were so focused on military victory and salvation from the Romans, but Jesus had a bigger salvation and a bigger enemy in mind. Jesus rode on a donkey. This was a symbol of peace, a symbol of peace, because you would never ride a thousand donkeys into battle. How many of you would be like, yeah, let's go to war? And then they make funny sounds. We had one yesterday at the amazing kids' egg hunt yesterday. We had like 230 kids show up in the rain. Amazing, right? I I almost asked the the dude, can I pay you to bring the donkey to church? But he said he charged by the hour, and I just couldn't afford it. Just couldn't afford it. But no one rides donkeys into war. You ride horses, war horses. So Jesus was bringing peace, but not peace between Israel and Rome. 
but inner peace and peace between God and a sinful humanity. Jesus had come to make peace between humans and God, not by killing his enemies, but by allowing his enemies to kill him. Do you understand? This is the upside down kingdom of God. He hadn't come to defeat Rome, but to defeat Satan on the cross. What we learn on Palm Sunday is that what keeps many people from receiving true salvation is an unchecked, misguided, and divided heart. It's not Rome that keeps us from salvation. It's our own roaming hearts. It's our hearts, divided and misguided. You see, to follow Jesus, we need a Hosanna from our misguided, divided hearts. We need a Hosanna not against Rome, not against the Democrats, not against the Republicans. We need a Hosanna from ourselves. To follow Jesus, we need not look outward to be saved from this or that. Rather, look inward and pray, please save me, God. Save me from me. Save me from my sinful, wicked heart. A heart that so quickly shouts Hosanna on Sunday and crucify him by Friday. You see, an unchecked heart will inevitably lead us to make Jesus fit our own vision of what we want him to be for us rather than taking him on his own terms. We end up making an idol of Jesus in our own image. A Jesus that fits around our dreams, our desires, our expectations. Let me present to you just a few different Jesuses that exist in American culture. The first one is a nationalistic Jesus. Nationalistic Jesus. The Jesus that waves the American flag and no other flag in the world. See, God will save us through our, this is the thought that God will save us through our government and through our political leaders, through who we elect to become the next president. No, Jesus riding on a donkey doesn't mean he was a Democrat, nor a Republican. These ideas didn't even exist back then. The people were doing the right thing when they praised Jesus, but they were doing it for the wrong reason. You can do the right thing for the wrong reason. They were recognizing that Jesus as the Messiah, but they were thinking of a Messiah who would rescue them from their earthly problems, mainly the Roman colonialism. And so we need to be careful, church. Jesus isn't a Democrat or a Republican. He's not even American. (laughs) Jesus is not American. He was born a Jew for the sake of the world. He was born a Jew for the sake of the world. The next one is liberation Jesus. Some of you more hot-headed people in the room that like to take weapons, like that, that's you. This is your liberation Jesus. This is the thinking that Jesus only came for the poor, for the sick and the marginalized, down with the rich, down with the 1%, burn them at the stake. This is a borderline revolutionary Jesus, and that one is also wrong. Then there's the Sunday-only Jesus, folks whose lives have not changed one bit after meeting Jesus. They know the right Christian lingo. They know when to say amen and hallelujah and hosanna and, and, and God is good, but their lives look nothing like the God who is good. You just talk the talk, but there's no evidence in your life that he's actually changing your mind, your heart, your soul, and your living. And then there's the weak Jesus. Anybody ever see a painting of Jesus and you think, I would not follow that dude. You know, you know know what I mean? He's like this, you know, like, what is that? That is not my Lord and Savior, the one who made the stars and the moons and the galaxies. You see, many paintings of Jesus throughout history show a weak and dainty, kind of lacking sunlight Jesus. Maybe even effeminate Jesus. You can't tell if he's a man or a woman. This was not Jesus. Rather, he is humble, but don't confuse humility with weakness. He was meek, but not weak. He's a creator of the universe. Before I share with you who I think Palm Sunday is presenting us as who Jesus really is, I want to give you one more warning about the dangers of misguided expectations. 
these misguided expectations that we often put on God from the perspective of one of the greatest preachers, I think, that lives in the city of Long Beach. Her name is Megan Fate. She's a mother of three or a couple of children, and um, just three years ago, her husband died during COVID and left her widowed and with many children. She's a nationally renowned speaker, travels all the country, incredible gift of God. And she said this about our misconceptions and our expectations of God. So listen carefully. She said, I'm pretty convinced that when tragedy strikes, what our faith is in is revealed. So if our faith is in a God who gives us a comfortable life, when tragedy strikes, that comes to the surface. That's not what I wanted or expected or hoped for. We don't even understand the motive of our faith. And oftentimes, that's revealed when tragedy strikes because you realize, oh man, I had faith in a God, not who I trusted as good. I had faith in a God who would make my life easier and better. And when tragedy strikes, and that doesn't feel like it's true anymore, you abandon your faith. If we don't have realistic expectations of who Jesus is, we'll turn on him real quick. When the fight gets tough, when the enemy comes after us, when you lose the things that you thought God had given you, you'll start cursing him on Friday. You see, the Savior King came to fulfill the Father's expectations, not ours. I'll say that again. The Savior King came to fulfill the Father's expectations, not yours, not mine. We don't mold Jesus into who we want him to be. He molds us into himself. What we are presented with on Palm Sunday is not a nationalistic or a liberation or a Sunday only or a weak Jesus. It's Savior King Jesus, one whose power is not measured by how much he can lift or how many people he can defeat in a battle or how many followers praise his name, but a power demonstrated through obedience to the point of death. His power is demonstrated by holding himself back and allowing his enemies to torture, mock, spit on, whip, strip, hang, and stab him. And then he goes, after he's experienced all that, to defeat Satan. That's who Jesus really is. But no one understood it. The crowds got it wrong, and in a few days of their misguided, divided hearts, they would turn their backs on him. How about us? How about us? When Jesus doesn't meet our expectations, will we turn our backs on him? Will we be those who spit on his face and shout, crucify him? He's not who I thought he was. You know what the good news is? It is possible to have a pure heart before God. It's possible to have a pure heart before God. It's possible to have an undivided heart before the Lord. Jesus himself said it in the Beatitudes. He said what? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. They will see God. So if you, like me, suffer from a divided, misguided heart, there's good news for us. Through Jesus Christ, through through him having his own heart divided on the cross, our hearts can be mended, our hearts can be made whole, our hearts can be made pure through the sacrifice of Jesus. But how do we continue to walk with a pure heart throughout our lives? I submit to you three ways that we can keep a pure heart before the Lord, an undivided heart before the Lord. Number one is confess all the time. Confess all the time. Confess on your own, confess to your brothers, confess to your wife, confess to your friends, confess to the Lord. Make a daily practice of confession. Don't wait till Saturday till the priest is available and has an available appointment for you to go and confess. You bet yesterday it was full and the line was long because Holy Week is coming. We don't have to wait. We can confess even now. Confess that you need a Hosanna from your misguided and divided heart. Say, Lord, I am prone to wander. God, my heart is so so deceitful, Lord God. I don't even know what I want. I don't even know why I follow you, Lord God. But help clarify that in my heart. Purify my heart, Lord God. So confess and then pray. 
Pray often, pray all the time. Pray and talk to yourself till people say, you are crazy, my Lord. Just put in an air pot in your ear and then people won't bother you, okay? Pray, especially Psalms 86, verse 11, which says this, Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. You see, David believed that God could actually give us an undivided heart, and so do we today. God can grant you an undivided heart. He can reveal things in your life that you didn't even know were there. When you go into prayer and you say, God, what is in my heart? He will reveal those things to you. And that's why step number three is to invite God often to search your heart. Invite him into a search and rescue mission all the time, like every single day. Psalms 139, 23, and 24 says this, search me, God, and know my heart. Know my heart, God, because I don't know it. Know my heart, God, because I don't know what's in the folds of my heart, in the shadows, in those hidden chambers of my heart, Lord. Search it. Search it and know and see if there's any anxiety in me, he says, or anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And so how do we keep a pure heart before the Lord, an undivided heart before the Lord? Make a practice of confession. And then pray to the Lord, God, grant me an undivided heart. And number three, invite him daily to search your heart. Last Sunday, Pastor Sean reminded us from uh, the life of John Wesley that one of the best things we can do is to ask God, God, how have I made myself look better than I really am this week? Pray that prayer and you, you, listen, God will undo you. You will be like, I'm such a fake. I'm the worst husband. I'm the worst son. I'm the worst this. But then the Lord will give you grace and he will help you take better steps to do better by the power of the spirit, not by your own flesh. But we need to be those who have a purity of heart. God doesn't care about your hosanna if your heart is rotten. God doesn't care about how well you sing the worship songs or how well you dress to church if your motivations are wrong and evil. You see, when you have a pure heart before God, you begin to desire his will, his way. You, 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 see, you begin to see Jesus more clearly and begin to desire what he desires and not what you desire. You begin to realize, I've been wanting a Tesla, okay, for example, And I dreamt last night that I got a Tesla. I don't think that's prophetic. I think that was just part of this message. The Lord's trying to teach me. But he's like, why do you want a Tesla? (laughs) That's a little more hard, right? It's like, God, I want this. But why do you want it? So I started making a new practice, right? Rather than going online and shopping and then paying for it right there, I just let it sit for a day or two. Why did I want what I thought I wanted in the moment? Was I feeling lonely? Was I feeling sad? Did I feel that I earned something that day and therefore I can repay myself for it? The why is important to the Christian. God cares about the why behind the what. You can do the what, but if you don't have the why in the right place, it's all meaningless. You see this in the prophets in the Old Testament. God says, you know, I'm hearing all your worship songs, but you're not feeding the poor. I'm, I'm hearing the bleeding of your sheep, like that you're bringing your sacrifice, you're bringing your resurrection offering to the church, but you hate your neighbor. What good is doing the right thing when the heart is in the wrong motivation? When you have a pure heart before the Lord, you begin to desire his will, and you see Jesus more clearly. And the things you didn't want before, you start to want them, and they bring you joy. Now, for those of you who are greedy, giving feels good. You're like, oh, and I don't want anybody to know. You start to do it anonymously. You start to give and to be generous, and it feels good. What used to hurt now feels good when you do it for the Lord because you start to desire his will and not your will. And you also grow a grit, and you grow a resolve in your heart that says, Come hell or high water, I want to follow you, Jesus. Come hell or high water, I'm going to follow you, Jesus. 
You see, Peter said the same thing, but he didn't yet have the Holy Spirit, or he hadn't seen Jesus glorified. A couple days later, Peter says, right, I I will follow you, Lord, even if all these other losers turn their backs on you, I will never, ever, not ever turn my back on you. And what did he do? Number one, number two, number three from a little girl. He was afraid of calling himself a disciple of Jesus. But you know what happened after he saw Jesus resurrected? Oh, Peter lived on fire for Jesus. And Peter, according to history, even went on to be crucified upside down because he felt he was unworthy to die in a manner of his Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? You see, the Bible is increasingly honest, incredibly honest about the people we consider heroes in in its pages. John writes in verse 16, At first, his disciples did not understand all this, Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. You see, if you were going to write a document that was fake, you would make yourself look really good. John would have written, I was the only one who understood what Jesus was doing. Peter, the knucklehead, he did not. Right? (laughs) Judas, that guy, oh my Lord, let me tell you all about him. But instead, the Bible is incredibly honest about those we consider heroes. They, sh- they, they, they share their stuff. They air out their own dirty laundry. If you were writing a fake document, you'd make yourself look super good. So, just a few days after Palm Sunday, all of the disciples scattered and they ran. Some, like Peter, directly denying him three times. They did not fully understand what Jesus was doing, but after they saw him resurrected and glorified, they continued to grow in their understanding of who Jesus was, and they were willing to go to their deaths preaching about Jesus, every single one of them. You see, like the disciples, much of following Jesus is going to be an ever-growing journey of understanding. Your journey of following Jesus will be an ever-growing journey of understanding. We are always growing. Honestly, there are moments when I blow it all the time. 2 a.m. last night when our baby got up, I let my wife handle that one. And I was like, girl, I got to preach tomorrow. No, I am getting my sleep. <laughs> we had an argument at 2.30 in the morning. Anybody else? I'm like, this is not the time or the place to argue, girl. I need my sleep. (laughs) And the Lord is like, was that very Christ-like, Joel? Aren't you preaching tomorrow (laughs) about how self-sacrifice is the way of love? When I reflect on my attitude, I think, wow, that was pretty selfish. When I fail to be like Jesus to my enemies or people that I don't like. You see, we are on an ever-growing journey of understanding. Foolish people think they have Jesus figured out. You know those people like, I've read the Bible 17 times. You're like, how about you live it once, huh? Like, try living it. They're like... I'm serious. I've read it 15 times. I'm like, okay, God bless you. That's more than I have, but man, you don't look at all like Jesus. Christians are, ought to be humble. We ought to know that we don't know everything that there is to be known. And that we are on a journey towards growing. You know that Peter, decades after Jesus died and resurrected, he still kept blowing it? And Paul had to call him out to his face. We all blow it, but we are on an ever-growing journey of understanding. And my hope and my prayer for this church is that we would grow in understanding and following Jesus to the cross. He didn't come to defeat Rome. He came to conquer Roman hearts. He didn't come to bring world peace, yet he came to make peace between sinful humans and a holy God. He didn't come to kill his enemies, but to allow them to kill him, and then he invites them to follow him. 
We will forever grow in our understanding because the way of Jesus stands in opposition to the values and the culture of our world. And anyone who desires to follow Jesus must follow him through the highs and the lows, through moments of popularity and large crowds and amazing concerts, but also all the way to the cross. Amen? I got one last point for you, okay? Pastor Sean, thank you for giving me extra time this morning. That was amazing. You say, come on up. We're going to need you for this moment, okay? Remember how I mentioned that on Palm Sunday, Jesus entered on a donkey through the eastern gate? It's also called the beautiful gate and the gold, the golden gate. Well, due to some prophecies found in the book of Ezekiel, many Jews believe that the Messiah will enter Jerusalem through that same gate that Jesus already came through. Isn't that interesting, right? They're hoping, they're believing in the day when the Messiah will go through that gate. And we're like, it already happened. It already happened. Christians, of course, we believe this already happened. It is believed that for this reason, Muslim leaders in the 1500s sealed the gate shut with 16 feet of cement. Google it. Eastern gate. And you're going to see that it was a formal gate and it is now a solid wall of 16 feet of concrete. But how, how, how many of you know that 16 feet of cement will not keep Jesus out? It's a little laughable. Really? The, the God who made the cement, you really think that's going to keep him out? Listen, 16 feet of concrete isn't going to stop Jesus from coming through that gate. But you know what will? Hard hearts. Because hearts can be harder than cement. Jesus doesn't just want to enter the gates of Jerusalem, but he desired to enter the gates of every human heart that he might bring peace and remove all fear from our lives and help us live a life that looks like the cross. You know, the Bible compares humans to gates in the Psalms, right? Let me read it to you. It says this in Psalms 24, for all you nerds, you're going to read it tonight. I know it. Verse 3 says, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure what? A pure heart who does not trust in an idol or swear by false gods. Verse 7, lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is he? This king of glory. The Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory. Come on, somebody shout Hosanna. Hosanna. And so today we are left with an incredible invitation as you stand to your feet. We're left with an incredible invitation, every single one of us. The Savior King has made his way to the cross to die in our place and grant us peace with God and a fear-free life. We did nothing to deserve this. In fact, we deserve the cross and he took it for us. We should have hung on it instead of us. But he took it upon himself. And on the cross, he was victorious over sin and over death and over Satan and over all the powers of darkness. He is the Savior King. And now he is willing to come through the gates of anyone who lifts their head and looks to the cross and would cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna, save me from me. Save me from a uh, divided and an impure heart, oh Lord. Remove all fear. Give, give me that peace that I so desperately need. I invite you, Lord God, into the gates of my heart, and I want to follow you to the cross. And so by his victory on the cross, the Savior King reigns in the hearts of those who follow him. And so today I want to ask two questions as we all lower our heads. 
if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus or you are now coming back to him and you wanna say, Jesus, I wanna follow you. Come hell or high water, Lord, I will follow you to the cross. Help me have an undivided heart, a pure heart. I need that, I desperately need it in my life. I need salvation, Hosanna. If you wanna make that decision, would you just raise your hand? I wanna pray for you. God bless you, I see your hand. Anybody else? I want, God bless you, brother. I see your hand. Anybody online, just send us a message. I see you in the back as well. Let's just pray for those people. Lord, I pray for these people that are saying, Hosanna, save me from me, Lord God. Save me from my heart. Give me an undivided heart. Give me a pure heart by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. May they follow you all the days of their lives in Jesus' mighty name. And now for the rest of us. Do you want more of Jesus? Just raise your hand if you want more of Jesus more of the Savior King. If you want to live a Hosanna life, a life that says, God, I am so messed up, but you can make me better. And so we pray this, Jesus, give us a pure heart that we may see you more clearly and genuinely cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. And all of God's people said, amen. Can we shout Hosanna and amen this morning? Would you open up your hands as I bless you today? If you want to receive prayer, if you raise your hand to receive Jesus, meet us at the cross. We'd love to pray with you and send you home with a gift and an encouragement. I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, our Messiah, to whom all glory belongs, may you follow him all the days of your life, come hell or high water. God bless you, and we'll see you on Easter.